morning. Buenos dias. You faithful few. <laughs> you braved the, uh, the wicked weather of nice warm temperatures and sunny skies to get here. Good job. All right. <laughs> Good to have Jerry back. We'll wait till he's through. <laughs> he hasn't talked to anybody in a while. We've got to make the rounds. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> this is a rough crew. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray. Well, Lord, we thank you for today. It is the day that you have made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. We give you thanks. We've got your word. Uh, your spirit is here moving among your people. We thank you for that. Lord, we lift up those who could not be here. Young Aw sent a text that she had fallen down and hurt her back or something yeah. like that. And she thought she'd be better today, but she's not. And so we lift her up to you. Just ask that you would restore her back to health. And all those uh, others who are having issues, uh, especially back problems, seem to be the soup du jour around here uh, these days. But uh, we just thank you for your healing touch. Uh, we lift up Clarence to you. Uh, he's having some difficulties there in uh, in Douglas, not Douglas, um, Yuma. They're shutting down Bible studies and those kind of things because of COVID, and uh, that's just tough. So, Lord, we ask that you'd open all that up for him and that you'd give him opportunities not only to grow but to share his faith because he loves doing that. So just bless Clarence today in Jesus' name. And all those who, again, could not be here, we thank you for those who made the effort to get here. Uh, Lord, be glorified in the midst of your people. And they all said, Amen. Amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning. Leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Leaning on the everlasting arm Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, leaning Leaning on the everlasting arm What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arm I have blessed peace with my Lord so near Leaning on the everlasting arm Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, leaning Leaning on the everlasting arm your turn. Lean. Where else would we go? You have the words of life leaning on those everlasting arms. His kingdom has come. It came when Jesus showed up. The king entered. Remember he said, repent for the kingdom of God is now in your midst. Why? Because the king was here. And he's still here. And his kingdom is advancing. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, establish your kingdom. Father, establish your will in my life. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven may your kingdom come may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Jesus establish your king Kingdom. Jesus, establish your will in my high life. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, just come to the fountain, dip your heart in the stream of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away. In the waves of his mercy as deep cries out too deep we sing come Lord Jesus come come Lord Jesus come Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, just come to the fountain dip your heart in the stream of life let the pain and the sorrow be washed away 
in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep we sing Nothing but your will for me. I'm only free in you. Nothing but your will for me. I am only free in you. Nothing but your will for me. I'm only free in you. Nothing but your will for me, I'm only free in you. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, just come to the fountain, dip your heart in the stream of thirsty for him today drink drink deep from the well of everlasting life we have a father in heaven who loves his people who has literally moved heaven and earth to prepare the way for his people to join him through eternity. He is indeed a good, good father. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word. Your good, good father, sing it. Unexplainable, I can 
Hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. is a good, good father. Amen. How many are going through something tough this week, this year, this month? Well, you know by faith, because you've read the scriptures, you know, God will always make a way. Mm-hmm. Always. And when he does, it's to glorify himself even more than to bail us out of a situation he loves doing that but we exist we live to glorify him that's why he's poured out his grace on us and called us his own so that we might live we might let our light shine so that others will see godliness they will see Christ in us and they will then glorify our father who is in heaven God will make a way Where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see He will make a way for me He will be my guide, hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. Let's sing that again. Where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see He will make a way for me He will be my guide Hold me closely to His side With love and strength for each new day, He will make a way. He will make a way by a roadway in the wilderness. He lead me and rivers in. The desert will I see. Heaven and earth will fade, but his word will still remain. He will do something. God will make a way Where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see He will make a way for me He will be my guide Hold me close to his side 
with love and strength for each new day he will make a way he will make a way He will make a way. It won't be something we saw coming, but it will glorify him and it will edify you. That's just the father that we have. Holy Father, I come boldly to your throne, thirsting, longing for your presence alone. Hear me, hear me, oh God. Hear me, hear me, O oh God. Holy Jesus, forever the same. Mold me in your likeness, hide me in. Hear me, hear me, O oh God. Hear me, hear me, O oh God. Holy Spirit, lead me in your way. Spotless, blameless, made ready for that day. Hear us, hear us, hear us, O oh God. Hear us, hear us, O oh God. Holy Father, I come boldly to your throne, thirsting, longing for your presence alone. Hear us, hear us, O oh God. hear us as we cry out. We thank you for all of your healing that you've been doing in the body here. Be glorified, Lord. There's so much more to do. 
but our faith is in you. We know that you hear us when we pray. And as the scripture says, if we know that you hear us, then we know that you're accomplishing what we have prayed, that you're doing it your way. And for that, we are extremely grateful because our ways are not your ways. Our thoughts are not high like your thoughts. We thank you that you are indeed a good, good father who only wants the best for his children. No matter how we see it, your ways are right. And so we've come today to give you thanks and to worship you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I guess they've got some treat for you today to fellowship over while you're having some more good times and laughs and seeing what's going on with people so you know how to pray for them through the week. There you go. Biscuits and gravy. But I want to get you out of here sometime today. I'm not going to preach as short as Al did, though. You're going to suffer today. (laughs) You're their hero now, Al. (laughs) The short sermon. And a very good one at that. And a very good one at that. And? uh, What? <laughs> you're on okay i have a couple of announcements uh we need some more people to start signing up the list for the snacks here for the, the list is over there on the wall just put your name uh, next to a date so we can get all the way through J- april and may uh we're filled up to at least, I think, the second week in March. So we really need to start adding our names. And unfortunately, because we are small, it's going to be rotation of people doing it. So that's one. And the other one is Patty Armstrong and I have started to deep clean the church. We started in the kitchen, and we're halfway through. We would like other volunteers to come Thursday morning at 9.30. We work for a couple of hours, and what I would like to do is get started on the nursery and the classrooms and the library to get it all cleaned up and that spare room, whatever that's used for. So if you would like to volunteer, please come Thursday morning at 9.30 here at the church. Okay. Thursday morning at 9.30? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, first thing we have to do is at the top of your sermon notes, change that to 2022. I was looking at the calendar, it was, and it's the 20th, and I never got stopped. Just kept writing it everywhere. Okay. Well, we're picking up again with Paul, and he's been beaten by his Jewish kinsmen, but he escapes death only because of the Roman garrison's uh, attack on the mob, if you will. They come out of the Tower of Antonia, which has been affixed to the walls of, of the temple precinct, and they can come out in a moment's notice and stop any kind of riot going on down there, and they did, and they got there, and they rescued Paul from certain death. And what's the whole point? Well, the mob wants to kill him because he's trying to present the word of life to them. I mean, where's the harm here? Well, we'll get there in a minute. We'll see. Uh, It just further enrages the crowd when he begins to make a defense for why he's there and what he's doing. And they start yelling, and we won't see this today, but in verse 22, away with such a fellow from the earth for he should not be allowed to live. See, they were intent on killing him. This wasn't just a mob that was angry with his his politics. They wanted him dead, and they were going to do it if they could. Now, what we're going to find out here in this message is you can have impeccable credentials, okay? 
you can have an amazing conversion story. And you can have a calling by God's Spirit and still have difficulty being taken seriously by your peers. Oh, well, Jesus said it would be this way. So like Paul, we also have to get over it and keep plowing ahead. You see, Paul is the poster child for being rejected by family and friends when you share the good news. Some of you have experienced this. You, you got saved and you were so excited, you wanted to share the good news with family and friends, and, and you began to do that, and you found out real quick they did not want to hear your story. Okay? And so, but Paul, man, he's really got issues here. He's the perfect candidate to bring the gospel to the Jewish people. There's no one better suited. But most of them rejected his testimony, and they rejected it because they rebelled against God's salvation message. And what was that message? God said in the book of Hebrews that the old covenant was obsolete and fading away. Now, you got to stop and put yourself in their shoes for a second here to understand this is why it's this kind of thinking. Of course, Paul was preaching all this anyways, uh, even though the writer of Hebrews is where we get it. But he's preaching this all over the place. And it doesn't get worse than this. To say the old covenant is obsolete and fading away, you deserve to die, as far as they're concerned. That, that's the worst of the worst of the worst of things you could say. And if that wasn't injurious enough to the religious pride, God was sending Paul to the Gentiles because God wanted to include those unclean dogs, the Gentiles, in his great plan of salvation. The Gentiles! Oy vey! What will he think of next? It's just crazy. The Jews hated the Gentiles. They felt they were dogs. They called them dogs because a dog was a dirty, filthy animal. They believed they were the only people of God, and that was it, and God hated the Gentiles too. Well, that's not true. We know that's not true because we've read the Bible. The, prob the bottom line here is that God's historical redemptive plan is going to be completed. And He can use your background and talents to further the gospel witness. He can use all the gifts and talents and experiences you've had. He can. He does, or he can throw you into circumstances outside of your comfort zone. Remember, it's his choice. He knows what he's doing. So we must just choose obedience and enjoy the ride. He can do as he wills because, don't forget, he owns us. We were bought with a price the precious blood of a lamb. Let's look at our scripture. Chapter 22 of Acts, beginning here with verse 1. This is what's called Paul's defense. Uh, the word is apologia, which is where we get the word apologetics. It doesn't mean you're apologizing for being a Christian. Apologetics is the field of study in Christianity where you're making a defense for the gospel and you're telling people why they need to get saved. Okay, you're not backing down, you're not backing away. Sometimes we confuse it with an apology. I'm so sorry I preached the good news to you. No, that's not it. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing him in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. He was speaking Aramaic, which at the time was the Hebrew language. Okay, Hebrew wasn't being spoken. It was a dead language. It was revived later. But they all spoke Aramaic. Aramaic. And he said, and here he goes, he's making a defense. I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, Jerusalem, educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. You know, kill him, kill him, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way, Christianity, to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. He's not fabricating. 
When he went out and got, he was a hit man. And when he went out and got them, he brought them back and they put them in prison and made sure they died. Okay, so he carried this with the rest of his life. Binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear witness. They sent me. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. He was a hitman. He was a Jewish hitman sent by the hierarchy of the Jerusalem priesthood. Now, let's look at his impeccable Jewish credentials. Let's see who we're dealing with here. Because he's telling them. He's telling them what they're dealing with. Listen to this. Now, our credentials may command respect among certain audiences until we mention the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then everything goes crazy, doesn't it? And then our credibility becomes suspect. We might think that our pedigree makes us a natural evangelist. I was raised in a Christian home, and I went to church all my life. And I, you got a pedigree, right? You, you know all that. You're raised in church. You were raised in Sunday school. Uh, you went, maybe you went to Bible college. You know, you got all this going on. You got a pedigree. People should listen to you. How often does that work? But Paul, as Paul found out, everything's fun and games until Jesus is mentioned. Then everybody gets their eyes poked out, like having a Red Ryder BB gun. Make no mistake, sinners content with their sin don't want a Savior. Now, I don't know if you've heard anything, but you've got to hear that. Sinners who are content with their sin are not interested in your Savior. Oh, they just have to be. No, they don't. They are naturally opposed to the Savior. It takes an act of God to cause someone to receive Jesus Christ by faith. It's a gift God bestows. You don't just do it. Well, if I give them a compelling reason, if I really boil it down and really sell it, because I'm a good salesman, I've got a pedigree and credentials, you know, and just sell it. You could sell all day long and you won't move one person because it's an act of God. You see, sinners content with their sin don't want a savior. They want absolution. They want you to tell them it's okay, whatever they're doing is fine and God loves them just that way. That's a lie from hell. It is not okay. The Bible is full of lists of those who will be in the lake of fire. It's talking about those who love their sin, aren't planning on repenting of it, and they're going to continue in that lifestyle. And, and the only thing they're going to do to make life easier is say, well, God loves me the way I am. He made me. That No, you were born a sinner, and all you've done is perfect it. Don't bring God into this conversation. He's the one trying to cause you to be redeemed. He's calling out. You see, they want to be told they're okay. You see this on TV all the time. You see it uh, in the um, NCAA swimming finals, if you know what I mean. They want to be told they are okay and that God loves them in spite of their rebellion against His moral law. You see, God's moral law is still in effect. It always has been, always will be. And why is that? Because His moral law is an explanation to us of his character, who he is. Only sinners under God's conviction, only sinners under God's conviction are interested in hearing the good news because the Holy Spirit's already been drawing them. God has already moved, and he's pulling them in. You see, the rest are just too busy justifying their sin. And after all, when you're fully woke... Who needs redemption? If anyone was perfectly fitted for witnessing to the Jews, it's Paul. His credentials are impeccable. He was a hero within Judaism. The Jews listened to Paul's defense until he spoke of God sending him to the Gentiles with the word of life. Then he was considered a traitor to Judaism and worthy of death. With all those credentials, a hero 
in Jude, a superhero in Judaism, worthy of death. Away with him. He should not live. Move him, remove him from the face of the earth. Wow, how fast is the fall, right? Let's look at his pedigree, because he mentions it. He goes from his credentials to his pedigree. He's born a Jew born in Tarsus, Cilicia. And he informed the tribune of that. He said, look, you know, I was born in Tarsus, and that's no obscure city, my friend. And the tribune goes, oh, that's true. It's like saying Boston or New York City or something like that. Got his attention real quick. The citizens of Tarsus were known for their pursuit of culture. They studied philosophy, the liberal arts, and the whole round of learning in general. The reputation of Tarsus surpassed that of Athens and Alexandria. Tarsus was a university city. Therefore, they all voted liberal, but that's another story. The bulk of their students were natives of that city. You know, a lot of these big cities in the Roman Empire, the, the, the young people would leave and go to a university city somewhere else. Not with Tarsus. That was filled up with their own people because their school was so good. People were coming from far and wide to go there. But once they reached a certain point in their education, then they would take off, just like Paul did. He was sent to Jerusalem by his parents to further his learning, to go to graduate school, if you will, to earn his doctorate at the feet of Rabbi Gamaliel. He also says he's a Roman citizen. Now that brings up questions. How did a Jewish family of Tarsus acquire such a coveted distinction? It was a big deal. How many of you are uh, natural born citizens of the sovereign republic of Texas? It's a big deal, isn't it? Thank you. The rest of you, at ease. It is presumed that some father in Paul's lineage, a father, a grandfather, great-grand, doesn't matter, had rendered an outstanding service to Rome. We don't know what it was, but it was something. So that family was given Roman citizenship. And that's a big deal. A big deal in the Roman Empire. Because most everybody else was slaves and peons. Be a Roman citizen was a huge deal, and it guaranteed you some things. One of the things it guaranteed you was that you were exempt from any form of inhumane punishment. You could be promised a fair public trial for any crime, and you were given protection against any kind of summary execution. They just couldn't take you and execute you. You had to have a trial because you were a Roman citizen citizen. That's how big of a deal it was. That's why many believe that Paul was beheaded in Rome, because beheading was a civil and humane form of execution. Everybody else got thrown up on a cross, soaked with lamp oil and lit on fire. But you were saved from that. He was saved from that. Being a Roman citizen had its perks. Paul treasured his Jewish heritage, though, more than his Roman citizenship and more than his birthplace in Tarsus. In fact, in Philippians, you've run across this before in your reading. Here's what he says to the Philippians. He's probably hearkening back to some of these events. And he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Can you imagine what it, it takes to say something like that? Blameless? That's what he thought. That's what they all thought. Paul boasted that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. His Hebrew name, after all, is Saul. And who is the most famous Benjaminite in Hebrew history? King Saul. Paul declared himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. His family was, therefore, of Palestinian origin and had not compromised with worldly Hellenistic Judaism. We usually just call them liberal Christians. 
okay, when we do a comparison in Christianity. You've got your conservative Christians who stick with the scriptures and the word of God, and then you've got those liberals who are in front of their church as a rainbow flag and all these other kinds of things, right? The Hellenistic Jews had adopted the Greek ways. They were still Jews, but they had adopted the worldliness of the Grecian uh, lifestyle, which involved a lot of questionable and sinful things that were going on. Okay, and Paul is saying, no, I'm not one of those. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, not part of that group. His parents were Hebrews, therefore, and they spoke Hebrew or Aramaic in the home and in the synagogue they attended. No liberalism there. Not going to put up with it. To maintain Hebrew orthodoxy, Paul was sent to Jerusalem during his formative years to study under Gamaliel. Now, he goes on to say, and as regards the law, he was a Pharisee. So no doubt, Paul's father and ancestors were associated with the Pharisees. And this would explain his being sent to study under the great Gamaliel, who was the leading Pharisee of the day. As for Paul's zeal for the law, he was a persecutor of the church. How much more zeal for the law do you need? Paul was basically a rock star within Judaism. Look who God reached down and grabbed a hold of. We call that election. When God makes a choice of what he's going to do, whether you agree with him or not, that's what election is. It's God's choosing. We can see God's redemptive plan being worked out through the most unlikely people in the Scriptures. You know this. You know this to be true. Moses, very unlikely person to become the deliverer of Israel. Very unlikely. Go back and read. Okay, He had some issues following him, not to mention a few warrants out for his arrest. Okay, how about Samson? What a knucklehead he was and yet God chose him to establish his redemptive plan how about Ruth can't say anything bad about Ruth that's a that's a woman woman you know she's Ruth was okay but she wasn't a Jew I believe she was a Moabitess if I'm not mistaken God what are you doing <laughs> you can't pick someone outside the tribe as part of your historical redemptive plan. Can you hear him? Really? You want to uh, stake your life on that? You a betting man? See, God can do whatever he wants to do. How about David, my favorite punching bag? <laughs> I know. David's a man after God's own heart. There's no questioning the scripture about that. That's what God says. That's what it is. But look at his story. What an unlikely cad, and God chose him and used him mightily. How about Esther? Again, can't say anything bad about Esther. But look how God used her. Very, unlike, very unlikely situation, very weird. But he used her to keep the Jewish people from being extinguished during that period of time. How about Jonah? Everybody's favorite cooperative prophet. Wow. You see, God will use the most unlikely people to accomplish his historical redemptive plan. And why is that? Because then we can't say, well, I did that. That's me. That's no. We just have to look at God and go, you're always right. I don't get it, but thank you. You see, they all seem... Unlikely choices to our limited vision, but in God's spiritual economy, they're the perfect fit. God chooses the simple and weak, thank you, Jesus, to shame the wise and strong. How many feel that they're simple and weak? God's using you. I know you folks. I see what you're doing. God's using you. That's a good thing. But he uses the simple and weak to shame what? The wise and the strong. So therefore, do not sell yourself short. You are God's instrument for His purposes. I don't care what you think. That's the facts. You're His instrument 
for His purposes. So wake up and start paying attention. He wants to use you. Now, Paul is the violent enemy of the church, and he's a very unlikely hero of the Christian faith. He was a Jew with an impeccable pedigree, cultured, learned, taught by the best rabbis, and trusted by the priestly class. Thus, he was the perfect antagonist to this budding messianic movement known as Christianity. He was employed as a hitman by the priestly hierarchy of Jerusalem. Paul traveled to outlying provinces to arrest Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem for punishment, which often included death. Acts 9.1, he says it himself when we read about his conversion experience in Acts 9. He says, but Paul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Went to the high priest. What did he go for? Warrants. To go to Damascus and start loading them up in a chariot and bringing them back. Very unlikely hero of Christianity. But see what God can do? He can do that with you. Paul had a stellar background to be an apostle to the Jewish people. I mean, now, okay, so we'll give God this, all right? Okay, God, you can pick whoever you want. All right, you pick Paul. Man, we got some questions about that, but all right, you know, you're in charge and all that. So, so, so you're going to send him to the Jewish people because of his pedigree and, and all of his credentials. And God says, eh. no, I think I'm going to send him to the Gentiles mainly. What? That doesn't make sense. He's perfectly equipped to be an apostle to the Jews. God says, well, that's your reasoning, but you're wrong, as usual. I'm sending him to the Gentiles because now he's going to have to trust me because they don't trust him. And he did, he did witness to Israel. We see that as you go through Acts, every chance he got. But notice whatever happened, whenever he tried, what happened? He got kicked back in his face because that was not his main calling. Now, you can witness to anybody and everybody, right? There's no rules of who you can't talk to. Whoever God's leading you to witness to, you witness to. But you're going to find he's equipping you to minister to maybe a certain kind of person, a certain kind of group. You never know with him. Just trust him and go along for the ride. See what he's up to. See, Paul's main calling, as we see in the Scriptures, was to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, Peter, on the other hand, the uneducated and roughneck fisherman, was commissioned as the apostle to the circumcised, the Jews. Now, that makes sense. Peter was a Jew, right? But he was not cultured. He did not have a good pedigree. He had no credentials other than knowing which side of the boat to throw the net. Do you see God's divine reasoning in the irony in these commissions? God sent a cultured Pharisee to the Gentiles and a blue-collar roughneck to the Jerusalem elite. And both apostles, therefore, would have to trust God and not trust in their own strength. And that's how he works. The moment you start trusting in your own strength, you're ready to crash right into the mountainside. Note how God utilizes our weaknesses to bring, uh, where did I jump off? Oh, use our to bring Him glory. Sure, He can prepare us to minister based on our strengths. He can do it. I'm not saying He won't do it. I'm not saying He can't do it. But we have to be careful because when that happens, it may lead us into trusting in ourselves. And that is the ultimate weakness, trusting in yourself. Paul David Tripp says in his devotional, New Morning Mercies, he says, the way to enter into that strength, or the real strength, is to admit how little strength you actually have. That's how you start. Grace frees me from being devastated that I can no longer trust me, because grace connects me to the one who is worthy of my trust and who will always deliver what I need. See, we're all just panicked that we can't trust in ourselves. But grace is being given to us by our Father in heaven. He said, don't, don't trust in yourself. I'm giving you the grace to trust in me. See what I can do. Because if you haven't noticed, you're pretty much a train wreck. 
And they all said, Amen. Amen. Often God will shake our self-confidence by placing us into evangelistic situations for which we do not think we are prepared or qualified. But rather than being a disaster, this causes us to depend upon the Holy Spirit. So we have to walk by faith and not by the strength of our sight. And in such cases, we succeed, much to our surprise, and God gets the glory. Because we know we couldn't do it. We're still flabbergasted about what he did. Paul was the poster child for redemptive grace. If God can save Paul and put him to work sharing the gospel, just think of what he can do with you. Think about it. I've told you to do it. Start doing it. Think about it. You see, all believers have a calling. The question is, what's yours? Now you're thinking, what's yours? Take a moment. Ask him. I'll wait. You already had lunch. I'm not worried about keeping you over. (laughs) Have you taken the time to ask God what assignment he has for you? Trust me, he has something for you to do that will advance his kingdom. That's what he's all about. And that's why you're still here. If he does not have a plan for you to advance his kingdom, he'll take you home like that. But you're still here because he has a calling on your life. The question is, what is it? You know, it doesn't have to be a big assignment. We always see in America, you know, United States, everything's big. In Texas, everything's even bigger than the United States, right? Big, big, big. It doesn't have to be a big assignment because faithfulness comes in all sizes. So I want you to ask him right now. Just ask him. Don't worry, he doesn't get confused with all the voices. He can handle it. Just ask him. Let's now look at Paul's conversion. We saw his credentials. Let's look at his conversion. He says, As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Well, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now, those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise, go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. This is Paul retelling his conversion experience that happened in chapter 9 of Acts. Now, Good storytelling always trumps dry facts. Nothing wrong with facts, but if you could tell a good story, you got the audience, right? After stating his credentials, Paul launches into this spellbinding narrative. Now, you have to be a Jew in Jerusalem to really appreciate what this is. I mean, they are on the edge of their seats. They want to kill him for sure, but they want to hear the rest of the story. Man, this guy's going big guns here. He's saying everything we want to hear, but we still need to kill him. But still, let him finish. He was on his way to arrest traitorous cult members, Christians, who followed a crucified troublemaker. It's a great introduction. He's got the audience hooked. If you've ever taken any kind of writing, any English classes, composition, what's the first thing you got to do? Hook the audience with your opening statement. He did. Now he brings in the supernatural. Now that's always titillating. If you can bring in the supernatural, you got him. Paul speaks of a heavenly light that overpowered daylight. Think about that for a minute. Overpowered daylight, knocking him to the ground. But it gets even juicier. A voice accuses Paul by name of personally persecuting him. Paul, in a subdued and frightened posture, I usually call that the fetal position, wants to know who the speaker is. 
Now there's a hard right turn in the story, and it catches all the hearers by surprise. The voice of the supernatural attacker is the crucified carpenter, who is the very object of all the cultists' worship. Can you imagine being a Jew in the crowd? Probably could hear a pin drop at that moment. This Jesus of Nazareth connects the persecution of his followers to a personal attack upon himself. That's why you don't mess with believers. You don't mess with the brothers and sisters in your church. Though you may think you're right, they're still God's child and you will pay. He will take care of that situation. And this also establishes the earthly roots of Jesus, which complicates everything theologically for these folks. Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, that's a place. Uh, this is a real guy he's talking about, but then again, it's the voice of the supernatural that's talking to him. Um, apparently, that resurrection story, he's bringing that in. Everyone's kind of discombobulated a little bit. His only option then for Paul, because of all of this, is to obey in total subjection. Paul asks the Lord what it is he must do. His orders are go where? To Damascus, and he will be informed of the new life trajectory he is to follow. Blinded by the Shekinah glory of God, and that's what it was, the presence of God, which is Christ, had exploded upon that scene. It's brighter than the noonday sun. Paul is led by his associates into Damascus. On the way, Paul was probably meditating on one of the curses of covenant disobedience that we find in Deuteronomy 28. Remember, the, the Jews were told when they accepted the covenant at, at, you know, on the mountain from Moses and all that kind of stuff, do you agree with this covenant? And they, yeah, we all agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, all right, I just want to make sure we're all clear on this. Now, here's the blessings if you obey the covenant. You're going to have your fields are going to be, you know, growing crops. Your animals are going to be reproducing like nobody's business. You're going to have a good economy. You're going to have this. You're going to have that. However, now that I'm done with that, let me tell you about the curses so you're not caught unawares. Your animals are not going to produce. You're going to have famine. You're going to have this. You're going to have that. You're going to have that for disobedience. Y'all on board still? Yeah, we can do it. We can do it. Well, we know the story, how that turned out, but Paul's blind. He's been struck down in the middle of the day by a light brighter than the noonday sun. Now, Paul is probably the most educated Jew on the planet at this time. He knew the scriptures frontwards and backwards, the Old Testament. He could recite it to you backwards if he had to. He knew the curses of the covenant. And can you just imagine as he's going into Damascus being led by the hand, what he's thinking? How about Deuteronomy 28, 28 through 29, where it says, as one of the curses of covenant disobedience, the Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind. And you, will grow, and you shall grope at noonday as the blind grope in darkness. And you shall not prosper in your ways. And you shall be only oppressed and robbed continually. And there shall be no one to help you. Can you imagine Paul who knew the scriptures way better than we do? This was Calvary. He's probably meditating on this and saying, oh, no. I'm in trouble. But he wasn't because God had chosen him for a job. Paul's persecution of the Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate disobedience for anyone claiming to be a strict follower of the law. Now wrap your head around that for a minute. Disobedience to the Mosaic covenant brings upon the sinner the covenantal curses. So, why would Paul be guilty of covenantal disobedience? Because the old covenant finds its fulfillment in the new covenant of Christ. To reject Christ, which is what he was doing, is to reject God's new covenant and therefore 
the old covenant as well. The Apostle John said it this way. No one who denies the Son, which is what all of Jerusalem pretty much was doing, no one who denies the Son has the Father. You may think you're religious. You may think you're on God's team. But if you reject His Son, you don't have the Father. You're a liar. A disobedient covenantal liar. That's what these folks are hearing. We don't catch it very quick because it's not our culture. We're not really used to that. And we can't transport ourselves 2,000 years back. But that's what they're hearing. He's dissing, disrespecting the old covenant. No, he's not. They just don't get it. He's trying to tell them what God prophesied all through the Old Covenant has come to pass in Christ Jesus. And if you deny that, you don't have the Father and you're in serious trouble. Boy, can God teach a lesson? Poor old Paul. Man, he's in school and he doesn't even realize, you know. It's all just happening so quick. Christ commands Paul to go to Damascus and wait for his assignment. And grammatically, when you take it apart, this indicates that Paul is part of an established divine plan, the historical redemptive narrative. He is to go and wait for his assignment. Why? Because God has chosen him before the foundation of the world to do this job, and now Paul is beginning to understand what God wants. Now, we all have our conversion story, right? I hope you do. I hope you've got a conversion story of some sort. It doesn't have to be fancy or anything, but we all have one. And it's our story, and we can tell it any way we want to. But God issued the gospel call to us, and by His power, He gave us the ability to answer the call. You didn't accept Jesus based on your intelligence, by the way. God called you and made it possible for you to receive it. He regenerated you. He caused you to be born again so you could believe in Christ. We were saved through grace, God's grace, by faith in order to glorify God. Our conversion enables us to implement God's calling or callings in your life, whatever it may be. We were saved and given assignments to serve God and His kingdom. And like Paul, you are worthy of a godly assignment. And you can rest assured that God will bring it to completion. That which He began in you, He will complete it in the coming of the Lord Jesus. He will. So the last part is Paul's calling. It's shorter. We see this about Ananias, really. Verse 12, And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, he came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, Ananias was a believer. Can you imagine poor Ananias? You've got the mafia's biggest hitman sitting in your kitchen. Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight, and I saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on his name. Wow. Yeah, can you imagine the relief for Paul? I thought he was going to kill me here in the kitchen. But no, he has an assignment for me. Now, speaking of assignments that God will bring to completion, Ananias is a faithful servant who obeyed God, laid his hands upon Paul, prayed for him to receive his sight, and revealed God's assignment to this blind and broken beggar. That's what Paul was at this point. A blind and broken beggar. Now, we don't hear of Ananias in any context other than Paul's conversion. Now, my question is to you. Would you consider Ananias' assignment large or small? Something to think about. How about simple? 
or dangerous. Do you know the name of the Sunday school teacher that led Billy Graham to Christ? Would you consider that teacher's assignment large or small? See, Ananias was a devout man according to the law and well spoken of by the Jews. He respected the law and was responsive to Jesus. You see, he was a believer. And it was Ananias who gave Paul his commission from the God of our fathers. That's just another tie-in to the Jewish roots of God's promised new covenant. Ananias tells Paul that he will be a witness of the righteous one, that's Christ, having heard and seen him. That's what happened on that day. He heard and saw the Lord of glory. Therefore, Paul would be included with those who were witnesses to the resurrection. And that's why Paul always made that claim that he was a legitimate apostle. There were people that said, well, he's not an apostle. He didn't walk with Jesus. He didn't, uh, God took care of that right here. He saw him and he heard the risen Lord give him an assignment. He is an apostle. Ananias is a perfect example of an obedient disciple. His obedience was reluctant at first, right? If you remember the story in Acts 9, eh, no, Lord, I don't want to deal with this guy. He's a hit man. He's probably going to kill me. It's probably a setup. Who knows what's going to happen? God said, you going to do this or do I squash you like a bug? Now, he didn't say that, but I'm just kind of interpreting it that way. And so he came around and agreed. He finally obeyed God's assignment for him. And because Ananias was an obedient disciple, he was also an evangelist. You see, we're all evangelists or witnesses tasked with the sharing of the good news of the gospel. You know, the word witness is where we get our English word martyr. Coincidence? I think not. Daniel Niles said early part of the century. Evangelism is witness. It is one beggar telling another beggar where to get food. The Christian does not offer out of his bounty because he has no bounty. He is simply a guest at his master's table. And as evangelist, he calls others too. Come and eat. Come to the table. See, we all share in being an Ananias. We're believers going about our daily routine, then God shows up with an assignment. And more than likely, we're going to hesitate and rehearse all the reasons why God has chosen the wrong person. Sounds like Moses, doesn't it? But that's natural. When the Spirit of God shows up and starts saying something, you know what the first reaction of a sinful human being is? No. No. But fortunately, he gives us a chance to squirm around a little bit, and then we come to agree with what he says. You see, we exhaust ourselves and we exhaust all the excuses for why God needs to just keep looking. No, nah, it's not me. Go find someone else. But of course, God doesn't make mistakes. So really, we're just left with choosing obedience or disobedience. And at this point, Joshua's declaration of unreserved faith in the Lord comes to mind. Joshua 24, 15. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, well, then choose this day whom you will serve, whether it's the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's what it all boils down to. As Bob Dylan, the great prophet and theologian said, you've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. And he's right.
When we study the Apostle Paul, we see that pedigree and training can be a hindrance to following God. They don't have to be. But people always seem to trust in themselves rather than the wisdom of God's calling. In other words, all of our human achievements can prove to be a stumbling block if they're not submitted to God. One of the best books I ever read is shortly after I got saved. It's a book by Roy Hessian called The Calvary Road. He said this, Victorious living and effective soul winning service are not the product of our better selves and hard endeavors, but are simply the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We are not called upon to produce the fruit, but simply to bear it. The conversion and calling of Paul is a great example of God's grace and divine wisdom. And like Paul, every one of us was saved from sin and pride, delivered from the kingdom of darkness and commissioned to share the good news of the kingdom. God knows what He wants us to be and do, where He wants us to do it, and when we are to do it. You see, the power to do is not from Nike. It's from God. So just do it. You see, God is the source, the vine through which flows all the power of God. And as long as we're attached to the vine, we will naturally bear fruit that lasts. Eternal fruit, spiritual fruit, actually the character of Jesus himself. And that surely beats being spiritually blind, broken, and bum-fuzzled. I needed a third B. And bum-fuzzled is one of my favorite words of all time. Let's close with 2 Timothy 4.5. Paul says in 2 Timothy, talking to Timothy, as for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Let's take that to heart today. That's to us. Fulfill your ministry. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks today for your word. You know, sometimes the, the little narrative things seem like, well, what's in there? What's in there? But as you dig into it, Father, you have us dig into it. We start finding gold upon gold upon gold. Things you're showing us that we didn't see. And, and this story about Paul and his conversion is like that. Thank you. Thank you for all your wisdom. Thank you for your calling. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, and they all said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.